So thank you, both of you, for coming. Um, you'll notice, if you're watching The Real Truth About Health Conference, that we have a panel every night at 7 o'clock. And we either have four, five, six, or seven people on it. Um, this panel only has two people, and there's a reason. And the reason is that there are hundreds of authors to choose from who speak about whole food, plant-based diet, and there's a tremendous amount that speak about climate change and the environment. We do not, there's not as much information circulating or as many books or as many authors focusing on antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So I'm very grateful that we were able to have both of these speakers here tonight and that they've chosen to take their time and effort to focus on a topic that I believe is very worthy of everyone's time. So to get started, the first question I want to ask both of you is, there's a lot of people who are busy, they're reading all kinds of things, and we don't always get that much information on this topic. I get four newspapers at home, at home the New York Post, um, Newsday, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And every day, they talk about the stock market, the Trump investigation, they used to talk about Hillary's emails, there's a lot of things talked about. And I think it's very much the exception if I ever read anything about antibiotic resistant bacteria. Does this mean that we should assume that this is a secondary topic, not of significant health concern, not very important because it's not written about, it's not on the news that often? Um, why are you taking your time to write books about it and speaking about it and devoting all this energy when I kind of don't read about it that much in the mainstream press? So what, what is your thoughts? So as a former newspaper reporter, first, let me thank you for subscribing to all those newspapers. <laughs> it's very important and today more than ever that journalism uh, be kept healthy. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. So. The, the former Secretary General of the United Nations has called antibiotic resistance the greatest and most urgent global risk. The chief medical officer of the United Kingdom has compared its threat to society to as serious as terrorism. The former head of the CDC here in the US talks about resistant bacteria with phrases like nightmare bacteria that the annual toll of death around the world is supposed to be 350,000 deaths a year, predicted to go up to 10 million deaths a year if we don't change the trend of drug-resistant infections. But what I find, and I'm really interested to hear David's point of view as well, is that drug-resistant infections are a, a kind of a stealth problem. And that's partly because when they occur, they are so frightening that none of us can really empathize with them. None of us want to think of ourselves as someone who's devastated in an intensive care unit or as the parent of a child who's died suddenly of drug-resistant staph pneumonia. It's so terrifying that it's a thing that I think we kind of push away from ourselves. And maybe we in the media haven't done enough to, to publicize it, though goodness knows I'm, do I'm trying my hardest. What do you think? Yeah, I, 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 I agree. It, that's definitely a part of it. I think um, there's other factors, too. I, I think it's enormously hard to explain what it's about. So even if somebody does have a loved one who dies, uh, oftentimes maybe they're not told the details about the resistant infection. They might know that they're you know, their family member, their organs shut down, or they had a uh, blood infection, septicemia, uh, all of, both of which can be due to a resistant organism, but that's not how people in hospitals might talk about it. Of course, the other problem is that I've tried, and I can't explain the problem in 140 characters. I don't know about you. I, the thing that you just said is really interesting to me because you know if you've ever had the misfortune to have uh, a family member who's, who goes to the hospital and is in the hospital and has a, uh, is, has a procedure or, or has care that 
They're billed for. When you get the bill, there's certain codes that indicate everything that happened to your person, what their diagnosis was, what was done to them, and so forth. There are no codes for antibiotic-resistant infections. And antibiotic-resistant infections are not reported on death certificates. So it's actually hard to find out. You might, as David has just said, had, have someone who's had a drug-resistant infection in your family, someone who's incurred that in the hospital or caught it in the outside world and was made sick by it. But you might not know it from their health paperwork. It's not something that we do a good job of surfacing in healthcare. Right, right. I think the other thing about the media is that uh, media media friendly stories are fast disasters, you know, really overwhelming things that happen quickly. Uh, this is not that. This is a disaster sort of in several decades in the making, uh, like some other things that are pretty prominent now. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, the iceberg floating in the North Atlantic. And uh, we're on the Titanic, and uh, we're getting closer and closer, and um, I guess some of us have already hit the iceberg, but the rest of us are in the ship just behind the Titanic, you know, um, hoping that we don't hit it too. Yeah, I like the idea of it being a mass disaster in slow motion. So what exactly is the problem if an antibiotic doesn't work? I mean, if an antibiotic doesn't work, can you just rest and eat a little healthier and, you know, and just be slowed down? Or what, what I, you know, we live in a world, we've grown up in a world where there are antibiotics. What are the consequences? Like what percent of the time do, does an antibiotic not work lead to death or something terrible? And what percent of the time, you know, it's how bad is it if we don't have antibiotics that work? That's a, that's a harder question to answer. Um, I don't know if one can quantitize, quanti quantify the percentage of the time. I'll say this, uh, there's a certain amount of unknown to all this, right? Uh, but that's true of many, many diseases that affect us. You, you prepare as best you can, but, but, but it's unknowable. What you can do, though, is, um, you know, people that really need antibiotics definitely should not shy away from taking them. You know, if your physician says, or your healthcare provider says, you really need an antibiotic, I wouldn't question that. But quite the reverse is true if somebody's telling you you don't need an antibiotic. Because the fact of the matter is, is one of the impacts of uh, resistant bacteria being out there is that if you take an antibiotic, uh, and there is bacteria around in your environment, in your body, that are resistant to that antibiotic, you're more likely to get an infection. So you could be healthy and take an antibiotic for something like an ear problem or a you know, sinus infection. It's not going to kill you, but you, know, you thought you needed an antibiotic. But you could end up with a much worse infection, uh, a much more worse a resistant infection just by virtue of you taking that antibiotic. So it just underscores the idea that one thing you can do is only take antibiotics when you really, really need them. This, this idea that maybe we don't need antibiotics and maybe there are infections where if we didn't take antibiotics they would resolve on their own <clears throat> is a really interesting idea to me. So let me tell you a story about what happens when antibiotics aren't available. In 1938, my grandfather's younger brother, who was my, my grandfather's family are from the Rockaways, not very far from here. My grandfather's younger brother was a fireman in Manhattan. And uh, on his day off, he was hanging out at the firehouse because he loved being a fireman and he wanted to be there all the time. And he was just kind of making himself useful around the firehouse. And a big, heavy chunk of metal, one of the fire hose nozzles, if you can imagine those big lengths of metal at the end of the fire hose, fell off one of the shelves that he was dusting and landed on his shoulder and bruised him and cut him up a little bit. But he wasn't seriously injured. 
And we would think probably, oh, that's the sort of thing for which you just go home and you just sleep it off and you maybe put on a cold compress, take some aspirin. So my great uncle went home to his brand new bride. They lived in Queens. And uh, he started to spike a fever and his shoulders started to hurt. And the fever got higher and higher and higher. And in 1938, which is before the start of the antibiotic era, there wasn't much that you could do for fever, which is a sign of infection, other than aspirin and ice baths, cold compresses. So they did all that, and it didn't work. And they took him to the hospital in the Rockaways near where my grandparents lived. And the fever got worse and worse and worse because there was nothing to hold the infection in check. Eventually, he developed what they called a blood poisoning and what we would consider now to be septic shock. And the only thing they had to treat him was that the men from his firehouse lined up to volunteer to give blood transfusions because they thought if they literally diluted his blood, it would make the blood poisoning less serious, and it didn't work. And he died at the age of 30 in 1938, five years before penicillin was licensed. So, so there are times, as David said, when we really need antibiotics, when antibiotics are the thing that, that ended the historic menace of infectious diseases, of infections that killed us. Um, we may overuse antibiotics and take them when we don't need them, but there are times when we really need them, and antibiotic resistance takes them away. So what type of things do we take for granted today that we just take an antibiotic and it resolves it, that if we didn't have antibiotics could be deadly? What, what are the common things that I'm not even thinking of where you use an antibiotic, it's no big deal, and that's the end of it, that if we didn't have antibiotics could lead to terrible out outcomes like you just mentioned? Surgery, childbirth, complicated dental procedures, um, cesarean sections, heart surgery, uh, any kind of open cavity surgery, um, broken bones that break the skin. What am I missing? Dialysis. There we go, dialysis. Anything uh, that in interrupts the, pr the protection of the skin. Chemotherapy. Uh, folks on both those things, I, I mean, they're long-term, but they're very vulnerable because their immune systems are suppressed. Cancer and chemotherapy. Right. HIV. Um, care after organ transplants. Yep. After joint transplants, um, heart valves. Yeah. So most of modern medicine is supported by the use of antibiotics. And if we lost them, those are the things we'd lose as well. Animal bites, uh, Ooh, good one. trauma victims. You know, if you're in a, sit if you're in a car accident, you're all cut up. Uh, none, of, none of those things that could cut you are sterile. So there's a pretty high presumption that if you start developing problems, it's uh, likely that you're getting an infection. The same with somebody in the battlefield. Uh, a lot of dirt and just stuff in your wound. They try to debride it, uh, which in addition to being very painful, just it's impossible to get everything out of the wound that you would want to to avoid infection. So. Um, one might look at that last example and say, geez, it sounds like this should be a really big deal, uh, a really huge concern for the Pentagon, for national security, for the Defense Department. And, um, and it is. Uh, but we don't hear as much about that. Uh, and, and we should, I think. Aren't there um, a lot of antibiotics? So if you're resistant to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, why don't they just give them the sixth one? And if you're you know, resistant to the sixth, not give them the, give them the seventh, there's so many different ones, why not just go on to the next one if you're resistant to the first five or six? <clears throat> well, first? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was in training, so you're an intern, right? You're kind of learning the ropes, you're in the hospital, and people in the hospital are sick. They often spike fevers. The first thing you used to do is to, uh, uh, you know, draw blood for cultures. So you draw the blood, you send it down to the laboratory, and then you wait 
There's a period of time before the culture comes back where you don't know what you're treating. So you try that one antibiotic, and let's say you don't get the cultures back until the next morning. Well, gee, it was resistant to that antibiotic. At that antibiotic. You know, then what do you do? Uh, so hopefully the next one you try is one that your culture has shown uh, to be sensitive, but in fact, that might take additional time because you have to do something called sensitivities, and that shows you what antibiotics that thing that grew out on the culture actually was sensitive to. I guess the good news is that labs are developing techniques to get that information back to the doctor or the nurse more quickly than they used to. So we're speeding up that, that time factor, but there still is a time factor. And if you're really, really sick and you're septic, um, things can change for you in a matter of hours, not days. So you just run out of time. And, and that's when people die, sometimes that's what happens. It's not like the bug that they had was completely resistant to everything. It's that they ran out of time to try everything. So in terms of this question about antibiotic resistant bacteria, what is the actual time frame we're talking about? Are we saying that in 20 years we're going to run out of it, in 25 years, in five years? I mean, what, what is the time frame where you can go to a doctor or you can go to get antibiotics and you, you would be, there'd be no antibiotics to treat you with? You would be, your, you, your issue would be resistant to all the antibiotics that exist. What kind of time frame should, uh, you, do you think we're in? Well, for some infections, the time is now. There are already infections moving around the world, and some of them have occurred here in the United States, for which no antibiotic works anymore. For others, maybe, you know, maybe we're five years away, or 10, or 20. I, w I want to go back to the, the thing we were talking about just a moment ago, about, you know, sort of how you run through one, two, three, four, five antibiotics. So what antibiotic resistance is, it's simply bacteria, disease bacteria, learning to defend themselves against antibiotics which are sent at them to kill them. So in the first antibiotic, for instance, was penicillin. Released to the military in 1943, came on the open market in 1944. First resistance in hospitals appeared in 1947. Moved around the world, came to the United States in the 1950s. So to defeat resistance in penicillin, pharmaceutical companies took the molecule at the center of penicillin that bacteria had already learned to defend themselves against and kind of tinkered with it a little bit and came up with a drug called methicillin. That's the M in MRSA, drug resistant staph, MRSA. Resistance to methicillin arrived in a year. So for every drug, there's been, the, for every drug sent at bacteria to kill them, there's been an adaptation in the bacteria that leapfrogs them ahead of the drug. And then we come up with a new drug, and then bacteria learn to defend themselves again. It's either a game of leapfrog or a game of whack-a-mole, where things keep coming up where you don't expect them and you have to smack them down. But the way that bacteria spread, one, the main way, that, one way that bacteria spread resistance is by having descendant bacteria that inherit, inherit that resistance. The other way moves even faster, but let's stick with inheritance for a minute. Bacteria can have a new generation in 20 minutes. It takes 10 to 15 years to develop a new antibiotic. So in that game of leapfrog, we are always going to be behind the starting gun. They are always going to be ahead of us. That's one reason why it's really, really important to conserve antibiotics and use them carefully is because if we use them up and we have to come up with new drugs, we will never get in front of the bugs fast enough. <laughs>